Morning, Glory, America, Bonjour, hi, Canada. I am Hugh Hewitt. Thank you for listening on this Friday before the New Hampshire primary. The news is just not good for Joe Biden. Oh, my goodness. If I had the soundtrack of a forlorn bagpipe, I'd play it in the background for Joe walking off. Dan Balls has written what is the effective political obituary of Joe Biden in the Washington Post this morning. But let's begin with the Emerson tracking poll. Emerson College, very good at this. They've been doing it for many years and many consecutive days. As of last night, over the the days, February 5 through 6, Bernie Sanders, 32%. Pete Buttigieg, 23%. Elizabeth Warren, 13%. Joe Biden, 11%. Joe is melting. Joe is melting away. It's very sad to see a guy who spent, you know, 100 years in politics, and it may be 100 years. He's only 79, so it isn't 100 years. But down to 11% or, I'm sorry, yep, 11% in New Hampshire. He knows everybody. He stayed at everybody's house in New Hampshire. He's mowed the lawn of everybody's house in New Hampshire in, in, since 1976. I mean, Elizabeth Warren's pretty sad at 13%. She lives next door, but... Deval Patrick, who was the governor next door for eight years, is at 0%. The Bernie bros are in charge with 32%. Pete Buttigieg, who won Iowa. Pete Buttigieg won Iowa. We finally know that. He won Iowa. He's at 23%. He's surging. But poor Joe Biden. That's Joe. Joe is gone. And they're showing the montages of him looking out the window at the White House. Losing his way on the stage. Come on, man. No, I'm serious. He is. And although Joe had many advantages. Let me tell you, I think I'm more in step with the lingo than any of them. And although he was at times passionate. Play the radio. Make sure the television, the, excuse me, make sure you have the record player on at night. The, the, the phone. 11% is 11%. All right. Uh, let's go to, if we can, the, uh, the news. The bad news of the morning is coronavirus. Two more cases confirmed in Hong Kong. City confirms first death. If you're on the Diamond Star off of Japan, you're really screwed. There are 31,526 known cases. All but a handful of them in China. 638 people have died. 1,568 people uh, have recovered. President Trump this morning has tweeted about the coronavirus. Just had a long and very good conversation by phone with President Xi of China. He is strong, sharp, and powerfully focused on leading the counterattack on the coronavirus. He feels they are doing very well, even building hospitals in a matter of days. Nothing is easy, but he will be successful, especially as the weather starts to get warm and the virus hopefully becomes weaker and then gone. Great discipline is taking place in China as President Xi strongly leads what will be a very successful operation. We are working closely with China to help. Good, 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 good. This is exactly what we need to do. We want to keep the coronavirus contained in China. We want to help the Chinese cure those who are sick. The president is leading. It's very good. The president went to the uh, East Room yesterday. And had a few things to say. Cut number one. As everybody knows, my family, our great country, and your president have been put through a terrible ordeal by some very dishonest and corrupt people. They have done everything possible to destroy us and by so doing very badly hurt our nation. All right, stop right there. He is laying it out. He's absolutely right. Adam Schiff, Nancy Pelosi, Jerry Nadler did a very bad thing. Very bad thing. 
It's a constitutional scar. They will live in infamy for what they did. It was a complete acquittal. Um, on Article 2, it was a completely partisan exercise. Mitt Romney voted to convict on Article 1, but it's still a partisan exercise. He's got his own views. He's a man of integrity. I understand that. But it was a complete partisan hatchet job from the beginning. Where are we? Donald Trump sums up where we are. Cut number two. For this cherished tradition are a lot of friends in the audience. Many really have become uh, friends. They are political leaders. They become great friends. That's all I get to meet anymore. That and the enemies and the allies, and we have them all. We have allies. We have enemies. Sometimes the allies are enemies, but we just don't know it. But we're changing all that. But thank you all, and thank you all for being here. I also want to welcome foreign dignitaries from more than 140 countries. That's something. Something. Then, that was from the prayer breakfast. The president went to the East Room and spoke specifically of Jerry Nadler. Cut number three. I mean, Nadler, I know him much of my life. He's fought me in New York for 25 years. I always beat him. And I had to beat him another time. And I'll probably have to beat him again. Because if they find that I happen to walk across the street and maybe go against the light or something, let's impeach him. So we'll probably have to do it again because these people have gone stone cold crazy. But I've beaten them all my life. And I'll beat them again if I have to. Stone cold crazy. It's funny if he crosses the... The street against the light, they'll impeach him. He's probably right. And then he brought up what it's always been about, the original lie, cut number four. Uh, But some of the people here have been incredible warriors. They're warriors. (laughs) And there's nothing from a legal standpoint. This is a political thing. And every time I'd say, this is unfair, let's go to court, they say, sir, you can't go to court. This is politics. And we were treated unbelievably unfairly. And you have to understand, uh, we first went through Russia, Russia, Russia. It was all bullshit. We then went through the Mueller report. And they should have come back one day later. They didn't. They came back two years later after lives were ruined, after people went bankrupt, after people lost all their money. People came to Washington to help other people. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, I say. They came, one or two or three people in particular, but many people. And, And it just goes on. They had a wonderful tour de force in the East Room. The president's got the momentum at his back. Joe Biden, not so much. Here's a super cut of Joe Biden bully. What do you do? You make it to the general. You're on the debate stage. He starts making fun of your age, your mental state. I mean, I said, come on, Donald. Come on, man. Press always asks me, don't I wish I were debating him? No, I wish you were in high school. I could take him behind the gym. I'm looking forward to this, man. You walk behind me in a debate. Come here, man. They asked me, would I like to debate this gentleman? And I said, no. I said, if we were in high school, I'd take him behind the gym and beat the hell out of him. Or let's start a real physical revolution if you're talking about it. The idea that I'd be intimidated by Donald Trump. He's the bully used to make fun when I was a kid in the stutter and I'd smack him in the mouth. Would you really fight the president, sir? I was talking about high school. Go back and read what I said. How many push-ups you want to do here, pal? Focus on this man, what he's doing, that no president has ever done. No president. Ask the right questions. Why attack Sanders? Why, 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 you're getting nervous, man. You said I set up my son to work in an oil company. Didn't know what you said? I guess you were straight, Jack. Any guy who talked that way was usually the fattest, ugliest SOB in the room. You should be looking at Trump. Poor, poor Joe Trump. Biden. 11% in New Hampshire. Fading away. Pete Buttigieg is surging. And Bernie has my vote. Stay tuned. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show.
The Hugh Hewitt Show. The Hugh Hewitt Show on the Salem Radio Network returns from break in 3 minutes and 15 seconds. The Hugh Hewitt Show on the Salem Radio Network returns from break in two minutes and 15 seconds. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Bernie Sanders on CNN last night. We've got to cover a little bit of Bernie talking with um, uh, CNN's Anderson Cooper. Cut number 13. He's talking about your health care again. Well, actually, most members of Congress, I believe, are. I think the majority are on board for Medicare for all in the House, not the Senate. Um, 
This is how you do it. And, and this is the answer I'm going to give tonight time and time again. That what our campaign is about, and I admit it, it is a different type of campaign. Because I'm not here to tell you, vote for me and I'm going to do all these great things. Ain't going to happen that way. It never happens that way. Real change never takes place from the top on down, no matter who pres- the president may be. We need to involve millions of people in the political process. And when millions of people stand up and they say to Mitch McConnell or any Democrat, we're sick and tired of paying, as is the case right now, for the average family, $12,000 a year. We're sick and tired of the deductibles. We're sick and tired of the co-payments. We're sick and tired of paying the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. We are going to take on, as a nation, the greed and the corruption of the pharmaceutical industry. That's when it happens. And that's what our campaign is about. That's why we call our campaign us, not me. Because I'm not here to tell you I can do it alone. I can't do it alone. We need to all stand up to take on the power of the healthcare industry. Then Bernie went on to talk about climate change, cut number 14. In terms of climate change, Anderson, the debate is really over. Uh, Nobody can say with a straight face, well, it's about jobs when we are talking about the future of the planet. When we are talking about whether or not cities in America and around the world will be underwater, whether we're going to see more and more drought. Everybody knows what's going on in Australia right now. If we don't get our act together, that is the future of the world. We are seeing a prelude to that in California with their terrible forest fires. I was in Paradise, California. That, you know, I, I think that was last year, but I get you, Bernie. Pete Buttigieg, also on CNN, talked about his health care plan and what it eventually means. Cut number 21. This has to be a country that manages things like immigration in a way that aligns with our values and our laws. Part of it is that we need to update our laws, which haven't been changed since the 1980s and have made it impossible for us to manage immigration in a common sense way. But part of it also is recognizing that immigration is part of the lifeblood of this country. And when I think about the city that that I served as mayor for two terms, we're not full. We we lost tens of thousands of people after the factories closed. We need more people. And there are so many communities that I go to, especially in rural areas, that don't just have a job growth challenge. They have a population growth challenge. It's why part of what I've proposed is what we call community renewal visas. It's part of my vision for how we uh, increase uh, the economic prospects of rural areas, is that if uh, an area that's hurting for population wants to welcome more, and many do, even in more conservative areas. So, uh, Pete's for bringing in all sorts of different people. Let's go now to Bernie talking about his vice presidential choice, cut number 17. Well, possibly, you know, what I want from a vice president is somebody whose worldview is similar to mine. And there are a lot of, you know, uh, brilliant women out there who hold that that view. So uh, we will be looking at that. So can you commit to saying you would have you would want to have a, a woman vice president to, but I, or, know, a, or a person of color? Yeah, yeah I don't want to commit. You know, it's always I don't want to. commit. I, I don't want to commit. Not that Bernie must have been a tough date originally. Uh, Bernie, though, talks about his brand of socialism, wants to make people to know he's not a communist. He's just a socialist. Cut number 18. Donald Trump is a socialist himself. He is a socialist who believes in massive help to large corporations and the rich. When Trump was a private businessman, he's a real estate developer, he himself received some $800 million in tax breaks and subsidies to build luxury condominiums. That's called socialism for the very, very rich. When we give tax breaks and subsidies to the fossil fuel industry to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars, so they can produce a product which is destroying the planet. This is called socialism for large corporations. This is called deflection, but that's Bernie. Bernie's at New Hampshire. Pete Buttigieg is surging. Joe Biden has fallen off the map. You're throwing away your vote if you vote for Joe Biden. It's that simple. I'll be right back. It's Oscars weekend. That means Sonny Bunch with his ballot next.
this has to be a country that manages things like immigration in a way that aligns with our values and our laws. Part of it is that we need to update our laws, which haven't been changed since the 1980s, and have made it impossible for us to manage immigration in a common sense way. We need more people. And there are so many communities that I go to, especially in rural areas, that don't just oppose is what we call community renewal visas. My
Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt in the ReliefFactor.com studio on Oscar weekend. I'm joined by Sonny Bunch of Rebeller Media. You can follow Sonny on Twitter at Sonny Bunch. You can follow Rebeller at Rebeller. You can go to RebellerMedia.com. You can even join Rebeller Media and use my name, Hugh, and get 15% off, which I did not get, not that I'm bitter. However, let's get to the Oscars ballot. Good morning, Sonny. Hey, Hugh. How are you? I'm good. But, you know, there are a couple of people who are dogging me over at Media Matters, Emo and Toby. And every day they listen to the whole show and then they write a story that's mean. And Emo and Toby, I try and talk. So just don't give them any material for Emo and Toby at Media Matters, okay? Okay. All I'll right. Try not to. Let's start right. with a documentary short subject. What are you going with? Sunny Bunch. Uh, uh, that is a that's a great question, Hugh. Uh, is there is there a documentary about emo and Toby? No, we could, actually, we could, we could have win. We've got in in the absence, learning to skateboard in a war zone, life overtakes me, St. Louis Superman, and walk run cha cha. Um, uh, Hugh, I I haven't seen any of those. Oh, so Sunny. No idea. All right, then no let's idea. go. To, let's no, go to the big ones. Here. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's skip to the big ones. I the the uh, you know the minor categories. Those are always kind of a toss up anyway. Right. Uh, I I will say score score Joker will win best score. You can you can mark that down on your office uh, office ballot tool. Uh, I've got thing. it in front of me. I can't find score. Well, they, there it is. So Joker gets score. Oh my gosh, twenty yeah. nineteen seventeen's yeah. in there. And Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker. Isn't that John yeah. Forever Williams? Definitely, definitely going to be scored. No, let's just let's just do the big ones. All let's right, do the big ones. Those are the those are the. Uh, let's the ones go in I the think. order of, of award: best actress in a supporting role. Does that go first, or does best actor go first? Uh, I feel like actor in a supporting role is usually first. Okay, but we'll, let's we'll go do there. Actress in a supporting role first. That's fine. Actress a- in a supporting role. Yep. We, we All got- right. The, the the person who will win this is Laura Dern. For marriage that story, the, that is the for marriage story. That is that is the person who will win this. I, I think that is a that is pretty much a lock at this point. Well, I'm, I, are, are we upset with that? I haven't seen it. No, she's fine. She's fine. I mean, I I didn't. Uh, I, I don't hate Marriage Story. I don't love it as much as lots of other people seem to. Um, and she is definitely she's definitely one of the more memorable parts of it. Well, yeah, I would I would vote for Kathy Bates because of. Um, of mercy because I've never been able to watch this scene where she breaks James Conn's leg. Misery. So I, that's why I would vote for her. Yeah, yeah, not mercy. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I like Kathy Bates too, but it, this is definitely going to be Laura Dern's uh, award. You know, it's weird. There, there were so many nominations for Netflix. Uh, Netflix earned so many nominations this year. And I, I think in the major categories that this is the only award that they're actually going to win. Um, you know, I, uh, Netflix had, had, uh, had, had the most nominations of any studio this year. And I, 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 and they spend all this money in the, in the hopes of winning, uh, uh, in the hopes of winning awards at the Oscars. And I, I really think this is the only one they're going to take home. All right. What about actor in a supporting role? Actor in a supporting role. Uh, Brad Pitt is a stone cold lock in this one. I saw, I saw some sort of, uh, you know, algorithm that predicts who will win the awards and blah, blah. And uh, Brad Pitt had something like a 90% chance of winning. Those. All right. The other it's, nominees, by the way, are Al Pacino in The Irishman, Joe Pesci in The Irishman, Anthony Hopkins in The Two Popes, Tom Hanks in A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, which I can't understand why he's not the best actor in that movie. But that's a strong category this year. It is a strong category, but uh, A, Brad Pitt, it, it's one of these things where Brad Pitt is due. Brad Pitt is due an Oscar. B, um, I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is going to get shut out of a lot of other categories, so this is going to be kind of a makeup win for the movie um, in in this one. Uh, but also, see if you just look at how that that ballot is laid out. The Irishman, uh, you've got two legends in the Irishman who are going to kind of cancel each other out. Um, Tom Hanks, you're right. Sonny Bunch, you're going all Gloria Borger on her. Now, now, Gloria Borger is a friend of mine, and she always kind of games the results in a primary and doesn't tell me who she wants to win. She tells me who's going to win. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's, what, I'm, that's what the prediction is here, right? You, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm no, I need to, both to from her. you. I need both oh, who yeah. you want to win and who's going to win. Well, I, I, I do want Brad Pitt to win. Okay, good. Brad Pitt to win. Right. Now, to so actor I'm, in a I'm, leading I'm role. Fine with that. Joaquin Phoenix and Joker, Leonardo DiCaprio in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Antonio Banderas in Pain and Glory, a, uh, Adam Driver in Marriage Story, and Jonathan Price in The Two Popes. Uh, 
In this one, again, uh, the the want to win and will win are identical for me. I think it's Joaquin Phoenix okay. all the way. That was easy. Um, I think uh, I think he is he's definitely going to be the the winner on this. This is another one where he is he's won every major precursor award, and he totally deserves it. The only person uh, I would have wanted to win apart from him, possibly if he had been nominated, is Adam Sandler in Uncut Gems. But he wasn't nominated. He wasn't. So. I, it's a, a miscarriage of justice. Actress oh. in a leading role, we've got uh, Cynthia Erivo in, in Harriet. We've got Scarlett Johansson in Marriage. It's a very small printed ballot here. We've got uh, Ronan in Little Women, Theron in Bombshell, uh, Renee Zellweger in Judy. Yeah, so Renee Zellweger is going to win this one. She's going to win. Uh, again, it's one of these things where she's won every precursor award. I got to be honest. I don't care who wins this category. I don't like any of these performances. There goes Emo like, and I Toby. I oh my I gosh! No, no. But I, see, Emo and Toby will be with me on this because I, uh, I'm actually, uh, I, I actually would have wanted either Aquafina uh, to be nominated for The Farewell or Lupita Nyong'o to be nominated for Us. I wanted a more diverse category here, but the Academy. The stodgy academy in its in its old set ways just wasn't wasn't down. You don't uh, know emo with, and Toby. The headline is going to be Hugh Hewitt allows critic to slam diversity. That's what that's what they're no, going to do. No, I'm pro diversity. I want more diversity. It doesn't matter it's what a, you a, say. You gave them an category. opening. All right, let's go to directing because I'm very int- having seen Parasite this week and last night at dinner. The fetching Mrs. Hewitt said to our friends Lucy and Rick and John and and Catherine, "Don't go to Parasite." In fact, she spent <laughs> most of the day yesterday. Today, texting everyone she knows, don't go to Parasite. So, directing, uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, the Directing Academy. Uh, Brian June in Paris, in, in um, is it Bong John? Bong John Who? Bong John Who in Parasite. Sam Mendes, 1917, Todd Phillips, Joker, Martin Scorsese, The Irishman, Quentin Tarantino, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Who gets the directing and who do you want to get the directing? Well, this is this is the hardest category to predict. I think it's it's one of the hardest categories to predict this year. I think Sam Mendes strikes me as the front runner. Sam Mendes strikes me as the obvious favorite for 1917. Um, that is very much a director's movie. The whole thing is kind of based on a gimmick that he you know kind of shepherded through into into reality. The whole single shot um, you know uh, image uh, of of that movie, um, but. Bong Joon Ho is very much a uh, uh, very uh, has had a great Oscar season campaign. People love that guy. He, people love Parasite, but I don't think they love it enough to give it Best Picture. So Best Director strikes me as a solid makeup Oscar for him. But you also have Quentin Tarantino, who one hundred percent deserves to win here. Uh, he Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was far, by far and away the best movie of the year, in my opinion. Um, and he directed the heck out of that movie. But I, I think he's going to win in another category for another makeup role. So we'll see. I don't know. I, my guess here is Sam Mendes. Uh, I would prefer Quentin Tarantino. To oh, win. so we have a diversion. So you are predicting Sam Mendes, but you are hoping for Quentin Tarantino. Yes. All right. Now, best picture, the 10 nominees are Ford versus Ferrari, The Irishman, Jojo Rabbit, Joker, Little Women, Inexplicable, Marriage Story, 1917, Once Upon a Time, and again, don't go see it, according to Fetching Mrs. Hewitt, Parasite. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is a category that I think 1917 is probably going to win. Um, it, it picked, it's picked up a bunch of awards, at, you know, the, the, uh, director's guild and the producer's guild and, and all of that sort of stuff. It is, it is a very easily digested movie that has some technical prowess to it and some great performances. Um, I think that is probably going to be the winner this year. There is an outside shot that it's either Parasite or Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I would prefer it to be Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, as we said uh, earlier. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think it is probably going to be 1917. I agree with everything you've said. Do I get my 15% rebated from Rebellar Media? No. no. You know, you, you should sign up for another account with the Hugh, Hugh, the Hugh, the Hugh uh, code. 
and then uh, give it, give it as a gift to someone. I'm just I'm to Dwayne, maybe. still deeply know. upset by that. Let's do original screenplay and adapted screenplay because I'm always kind of actually these are the only two that interest me because you did score already in original songs. I don't care about o- original screenplay. Knives Out, 1917, Marriage Story, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and Parasite. Now the, this is interesting because it awards original thinking and writing. What do you think wins this, and what do you want yeah. to win this? Well. I- you know, it, this is this is the other race that is possibly too close to call at this point. Uh, I, I for for the whole Oscar season, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was the heavy favorite to win this one, and it was the heavy favorite because this is the award that Quentin Tarantino always wins instead of Best Picture or Best Director. Right? This is like the thing that he gets as a consolation prize for being the most interesting and best filmmaker in Hollywood. Uh, he gets to win Best Original Screenplay every couple of years. Um, but Parasite has come on hard in the last, uh, the last few months, and I, I, I don't know. I, 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 it's, it's a toss-up. I want uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood to win. I think it will win. I still think it will win, but, okay. but, but don't be shocked if you see Parasite. I'm going to be yeah, shocked. Like Parasite, I'm still traumatized by. Adapted screenplay, The Irishman, Joker, Jojo Rabbit, Little Women, and The Two Popes. So, uh, boy, this is another hard one. I, I think the, the money uh, odds are on Taika Waititi's Jojo Rabbit. Um, oh. I think that is probably the movie that will win. Um, I personally would have voted for Joker, uh, but uh, I, I, I think it's going to be the funny Hitler movie. I think well, that's you know, I, I, I just thought it wasn't that good, so I can't vote for Jojo Rabbit. So I would have gone with the Irishman just because they should give him something. All right, now, uh, very quickly, we've got your ballot in, Sonny Bunch. Will you be live blogging at rebellermedia.com? Uh, either there or at the, uh, the Twitter handle, at Rebeller. Okay. Uh, okay. You, you can check us out there. And then uh, I have I, one I, I minute. Like I'm going to see Birds of Prey and the Fabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn at 11.30 today. Is that a wise oh. choice? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, look, if you've already bought your ticket, you know, you might as well go and enjoy it. Um, it is, it, it's a deeply okay comic book movie. I'm kind of surprised it's 90% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, uh, it is, it's, it's, uh, it, it is an R rated comic book movie, Hugh. DC is kind of moving into this R rated comic book territory between this and Joker. Okay. Uh, well, I got my ticket, so I'm glad you didn't tell me I'd completely blown my $15. Sonny Bunch, as always, a pleasure. And thank you for joining us. Rebeller on Twitter at Rebeller. If you want to live blog it or follow him at Sonny Bunch. Cause do you double post on Twitter, Sonny? Oh, he's gone. He always leaves. Something about critics. Once they're no longer on, you know, they just leave. They just walk out. All right, relieffactor.com. It is a long weekend ahead. Beach time tomorrow morning. Cold beach. Long run. Take my relieffactor.com. My four pills that you must have every... My lukewarm coffee. Down the hatchet goes with my Honor Bound Coffee. Do two things for me. Go to honorboundcoffee.com, order some great coffee, and boy, is it ever great coffee. And go to relieffactor.com, 1995, by Karen Kirkman, Resveratrol Omega. Every single morning, you should do it when I do it, which is at 6.45 in the morning, 6.47 to be specific. Relieffactor.com, support of the temporary relief of minor aches and pains through nature's best supplements. Been using it for years. You ought to use it yourself. ReliefFactor.com, ReliefFactor.com. Coming right back, Tarzana Joe on the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Joe? Good morning, you. You know, it's all over but the counting, uh, as they say in politics. <laughs> and so they say it in this poem as well. Though some sage said this long ago, it's worth it to repeat. If the contest isn't close, then the Democrats can't cheat. I have another maxim. You can put this one in quotes. Cheating's even easier if you don't count the votes. Yeah. Monday left the punditry blathering for hours. It looked so like a funeral, I even sent them flowers. Unable to think clearly, they turned their wrath on Iowans. The mood was dark and somber. I think I heard some violins. Nothing oh. folks to see here. It was just another news day, and we promised to have answers somewhere close to Super Tuesday. Losing makes them crazy. And losing makes them sad, too, because they didn't cheat for Hillary since they didn't think they had to. Voters on the left are so intent to take the prize, they even keep on voting years after their demise. When counting quotes, they have a way of gumming up the plumbing. These aren't all the ballots. Another truck full's coming. So when that party brags about the industries they're busting, stop and think a moment. Are these people worth your trusting? Yes, folks, tune in next Tuesday and pour yourself some scotch. Let's see if they can count the votes they cast in Dixville Notch. That's can't wait for the New Hampshire primary by Tarzan. Are you saying that Dixville Notch is going to be a botch? Well, oh, very good. Eleven people. I think they may be able to, to, to get, if they all show up, it oh, may be a challenge. Only the shadow knows. Not bad, Joe, for me this morning. Not bad at all for a Friday. Now, Joe, are you uh, are you busy doing Valentine's Day commission still, or is it too late? Oh, my goodness, love is in the air. Uh, so if think. you need a Valentine's poem in a hurry, write to Joe at Tarzana, Joe at Reagan.com, Tarzana, Joe at Reagan.com, and today's missive will be posted at Tarzana, Joe.com. It certainly will be. Now, thank you, my friend. Thank you, Joe. Coming up after the break, uh, I will be talking with Michael Pack, the director of Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in his own words. It's an amazing film. You want to hear this interview. Conservatives everywhere need to go out and see Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in his own words this weekend. Just go to justicethomasmovie.com, justicethomasmovie.com. I've interviewed uh, the Justice before at great length. You know how passionate he is. You know what great good humor he has. You know he went through the fire and it was forged. Tough man, brilliant man, inspiring man. JusticeThomasMovie.com to find out where it's playing. Now, pre-market check brought to you by Birch Gold. As you know, global concerns about the coronavirus and the soaring national debt remain. The coronavirus is not in any way, shape, or form controlled. And so, wouldn't it be smart to follow the lead of some of the world's wealthiest people and diversify a portion of your retirement savings into precious metals? My friends at Birch Gold Group make it so easy to convert an eligible IRA or 401k into a precious metals IRA. It will give you security if the dollar flounders. It will give you security if Wuhan coronavirus sinks the markets. Call 1-800-434-GOLD and request a free info kit and see if diversification works for you and your family. Or just call Birch Gold and open your precious metals IRA right now during the month of February, just this month. Birch Gold is celebrating February's extra day, the 29th, with a special bonus offer, bonus day bonus offer. For every $5,000 you put into your IRA with them, they'll give you a free one-ounce silver coin. So you put in $25,000, they'll give you five coins. Give those to your kids or your grandkids. Teach them the benefits of diversification of physical precious metals. But you have to call and buy this month. Birch Gold Group has thousands of satisfied customers, countless five-star reviews, and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Uh, And so 1-800-434-GOLD to get your info kit, claim your eligibility. 1-800-434-GOLD. The markets yesterday were pretty doggone hot. They are, they're simply shrugging off um, the coronavirus. Yesterday, the Dow was up 89 points, the NASDAQ was up 63, and the S&P was up 11. Overnight, though, everything got red abroad. In Japan, it was down eh, about a fifth of a point. The Hong Kong index down about a third. England uh, down, Germany down. Uh, we won't know till the end of the day. Gold is up 1571. The 10 year treasury at 1.64%. But wherever the market ends today, it, it will be the weekend that tells because coronavirus is, is the story that's driving the market. And as long as it's the story driving the market, you really ought to have birch gold.
800-434-GOLD. 800-434-GOLD. Also remember this week on Town Hall Review with Hugh Hewitt, Senator David Perdue joins me to take a look at Donald Trump's State of the Union address. We'll also discuss Speaker Nancy Pelosi's decision to publicly rip it in half. So do not miss the Town Hall Review at uh, townhallreview.com. Finally, my pillow is grateful for you to you. So grateful they've got an amazing offer. If you buy one, you will get one of their incredible sheet sets for free. Now I'm the towel guy. I believe in going to mypillow.com for the towels, which are the best towels that I've had in years. And all you have to do is go there and use my code Hugh, H-U-G-H. But they do have this buy one, get one free promo on the Giza Dream Sheets if you will simply use my code Hugh. We can call 800-951-5493. I think it's easiest to go to MyPillow.com. Look at all their offers, but don't use anybody else's code. Just use Hugh, H-U-G-H. Best deal available. H-U-G-H, get the towels. I'll be back. Hour number two, straight ahead with Michael Pack, director of Created Equal. Follow at Justice CT Movie, by the way, at Justice CT Movie, and stay tuned.
Hey, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. It's Hugh Hewitt on the Friday before the New Hampshire primary, where Joe Biden has fallen like a rock in the latest Boston Globe poll, an Emerson poll down to 11%. Poor Joe. But let's not dwell on that. Michael Pack is a nationally renowned director of wonderful movies. He has a brand new film out this week, Created Equal. Clarence Thomas, in his own words, you can visit and see the trailer at justicethomasmovie.com. It's showing across the United States, and it's about Clarence Thomas, one of the most inspiring people in the United States. Michael Pack, welcome. Good to have you back, friend. Thank you. Thank you for having me on here. Give us the story behind this. I've interviewed the Justice a few times on the radio show. I, I knew him back in the 80s when he was the uh, chairman of the EEOC. knew him as a judge on the D.C. Circuit. He's a wonderful guy. My grandfather's son, one of the most inspiring books I've ever read. What, what gave you the motive to make the movie, and how did you get access to the Justice? Well, I had heard... Uh, through some mutual friends, that Justice Thomas was tired of having his story defined by his enemies. He was tired of the half-truths and untruths that were circulating about him. So, unlike you, I didn't really know much about him. I had only, I only had what I remembered from the 1991 confirmation hearing. So, I met with him, and as you said, he is a, a lovely person. And I did some research, and I discovered what you obviously know, that he has a great story. It's just a classic American success story. And Horatio Alger's story is coming from dire poverty in the South, in the segregated South, to the highest court in the land through many twists and turns. It was obviously a great story, and I wanted to tell it. And luckily, he trusted us to tell it. And it's, the, the film is based on 30 hours of interviews that I conducted with Justice Thomas and his wife over six months. And really, the film is is primarily Justice Thomas talking right to camera, telling viewers in his own words about his life from the beginning uh, all the way up to today. And as you know from all those times that you've seen him, he is a great speaker and a great storyteller. Lots of people who know him only from his distorted media image might not know that. So, and you, as, a, as, as someone who's made television and movies myself, I think your most difficult part would be when the Justice decides to laugh he really decides to laugh, Michael. Yes, he has a great booming laugh. It takes up a lot of time. Uh, we have one time in the movie where we diverged a little from that pattern of him talking to camera, and we have him chatting with a few of his clerks where you, at the very end where you can hear that great booming laugh in full. But m- most of the film, you know, look, Hugh, you know this well, he's talking about really difficult stuff lots of times. I mean, his hard beginnings, his, uh, his being raised by his grandfather, but then his, his, his leaving the church and his, uh, his grandfather kicking him out and his radical period and, you know, his, his journey back to the right. I mean, and to say nothing of him talking about the confirmation hearing. So these are difficult things. So, you know, he wasn't laughing for lots of that. So, we, you know, we're able to have only, not have only have that problem at the very end of the movie. Yeah, it's been a dozen years since my grandfather's son came out, and I did a long interview with him then, Michael. Mm-hmm. And what, remember, what, I, what sticks with me about the book is the very early morning, very cold runs in the truck with his grandfather. His grandfather was a hard man. Uh, and Clarence Thomas loves him, but he was a hardworking working hard, demanding man, and they would make those rounds in an unheated car or truck uh, doing their rounds. And it's just, he had a tough, uh, there is no other childhood for a major American figure of which I am aware aware equally as difficult as Clarence Thomas's. That's right. I can't think of any either. And add on to that segregation. I mean, you know, compared to the other justices, let alone, I mean, even Abraham Lincoln didn't, you know, who came from hard scrabble beginnings. It wasn't as hard as Justice Thomas's, and he wasn't black from the segregated South. It's just an incredible story. And the grandfather is a central figure. I, I too, thought it was a great memoir, and I recommend everybody read it. But one thing you get from the movie that you don't get from the book is you get to see Justice Thomas and get sort of a personal sense of him. Um, you know, you, you hear him tell it, you hear and feel his emotion. Uh, I think it's a great to both read the, read the book and see the movie. And 
sadly, for lots of people, it's easier to go see a movie than to read a book. Oh, of course. And that's why Created Equal, Clarence Thomas, in his own words, makes accessible what a few of us have known for a long time. JusticeThomasMovie.com. If you want to see where it's playing near you, if you want to view the trailer, you go to JusticeThomasMovie.com. I'd like to ask you about one thing in particular, Michael Pack, director of Justice uh, of Created Equal. On this past Sunday in the Washington Post, I had a column about fake history and how Trump would view how, how Trump's acquittal would be viewed in 50 years. And it, it came after Amazon put out a fake history ad about Richard Nixon ordering the tapes to be deleted. Richard Nixon did not order the tapes to be deleted. And, and we don't know what Trump's acquittal will play like in 50 years. But I have this paragraph in Sunday's column, an example People today believe that at the time of his confirmation, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was guilty of sexual harassment of Anita Hill. That is not what was believed at the time. A New York Times CBS News poll taken October 28th, 1991, found the opposite. 58% of the respondents then believed Thomas's account. 29% believed Hill's. A sustained propaganda war has changed that, Michael Pack. That is very true. As you, those figures indicate, it was like two to one in his favor after his very moving high-tech lynching speech and his really fighting back against uh, efforts to get him to, re- to, to, to resign, as he said he'd rather d- to, to withdraw, rather. He, he said he'd rather die than withdraw. And, um, but yeah, that's right. The left continues its attack. And in the case of Justice Thomas, the attack is often tinged with racism. We have, we have cartoons in the film of him as a shoeshine boy polishing Scalia's shoes, as a lawn jockey of the far right. I mean, racist images that, as Justice Thomas says in the movie, you could not apply to a liberal African American without being accused of racism. But, it, but it's persisted over all these years. And those myths are there. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we're that we're making the movie. I mean, they are just you know, who gets to tell the history? I mean, if you let one side, the left, tell the history, you're going to get a very distorted picture, and that's why it's very important that there be historical movies and historical documentaries from the other point of view. So I beg your uh, listeners to go see it. As you know, go to our website. If it's not in your area, it's going to be now. It's in 20 movies this week. It'll be theaters. It'll be in 40 movie theaters next week. But if it's not in your area, there's a place to sign up. And if there's a big enough group of you, we can make another screening happen near you. But it's in New York, L.A., Dallas, Houston, Chicago. It's in a lot of cities. And people on our side, more or less, just don't go to the movies. They like to complain about the, the left-leading media, but they don't go. Whereas the left actually shows up which is why I think in some ways they deserve to own the culture. And RBG, the movie about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is a case in point. I mean, it was a huge success. Uh, you know, People went in droves, particularly her fans, but I went too. I, I learned something. I, I think people on the left should go see my film. I think they too would learn something um, about an important political person plus an inspiring story. But I want your viewers to actually go rather than just uh, indicate their affection for Thomas. But sh- but buy tickets and show up. Uh, JusticeThomasMovie.com to find the theaters near you. JusticeThomasMovie.com. Now, I hope to see him tonight at the State of the Union. He normally yeah. does come. I am curious if he liked the end result. Did he watch it? Well, he has not watched it yet. Uh, Jenny has watched it, and she loves it. Uh, you can ask him what he thinks. He's he's uh, heard from lots of people about it. I think he has opinions about it, um, and uh, we'll see. I think he eventually he will watch it. Look, I mean, it was hard for Ginny and um, Justice Thomas to do it. It was hard for Ginny to watch it. I mean, she teared up during the interview, and she said she cried when she watched it. It's not easy. Um, you know, these are t- there are really tough stuff. I mean, the, the grandfather relationship it was great, but but then he had a, you know, then he, his grandfather kicks him out, and it's years before they're back together. He has his period of of, of radicalism where he supports you know Malcolm X and Angela Davis, and only grad and fights with his grandfather during that period about America and his brother who's back from Vietnam. I mean. There, there's tough stuff in it, um, and, and then fundamentally, the Anita Hill period. It's hard for us to, to imagine. It, remember, only those of us of a certain age remember how amazing it was at the time. How the 
country was riveted on it and how hard it was for I, I've never been as angry as I was on the radio during that period of time but I I, have, I look forward to seeing Justice Thomas movie created equal Clarence Thomas in his own words it's a film by the wonderful Michael Pack go to justicethomasmovie.com find out where it is and go Go to see Created Equal. Thank you, Michael. Coming right back. Don't go anywhere. More on the latest in New Hampshire. Coronavirus, all the breaking news you need, the analysis you must have on this Friday edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Some sad music, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Joe Biden's campaign fading away. A brand new story at the Washington Post by Matt Visor and Cleve Woodson and Michael Shearer from Nashua, New Hampshire. Outside the castle-themed Radisson Hotel where Joe Biden has been staying, his campaign bus was parked, ready for events. But on Thursday, just five days before the crucial primary here, the candidate was nowhere to be found. Biden spent Thursday gathered with his top advisors at his home in Wilmington, Delaware, seeking a reset, perhaps a last-ditch effort to save his candidacy, beginning with a debate Friday night. He held no public events. Following dismal results in the Iowa caucuses that have rattled many in his orbit, his campaign is now simultaneously trying to lower expectations here, with some suggesting they would consider a finish as low as third place a victory, while also bracing for a second straight difficult election night. In one troublesome sign for the financially strapped campaign, and canceled nearly $150,000 in television ads in South Carolina, which votes on February 29, moved the spending to Nevada, whose February 22nd contest follows New Hampshire's. The move seemed to acknowledge that the Biden campaign cannot sustain a continued run of bad news. Oh, sad, sad, sad. Look, I, um, I, I know Joe's done, but what do you do with your vote? In South Carolina, it's an, look, North Carolina, in, in North New Hampshire, if you are a non aligned voter, non declared, go vote for Bernie. We want a choice, not an echo, in November. We want the real deal. We want a socialist, socialist. That's why I voted for Bernie Sanders by absentee in Virginia, and I hope. If you're eligible, wherever you are, if the law lets you, never break the law. We're not Democrats. Emo and Toby, did you write that down over at Media Matters? Don't break the law. We're not Democrats. Emo was so overwhelmed by the number of stories that Emo was writing about the Hugh Hewitt show that they assigned Toby at Media Matters. And I got a call from D.C. Do you know Media Matters is dogging you every day? They're writing a story. And I said, what's Media Matters? And they reminded me. It's the... uh, far, far left weirdo world of crazy people and interns who can't get a job anywhere else in D.C. from the left. And for whatever reason, they've decided I'm the target of the week, which is fine, but I'm trying to get Emo to go to therapy and break out of there. It's kind of like being in a cult. And instead, they've doubled down. They assigned Toby. So Emo and Toby are working together, and I, I just want them to know they can leave. Just walk out that door. You don't have to stay there. Go work at a Starbucks. Go get a real job. It'll be better for you in the long run. But wherever it's legal, South Carolina, it's legal to vote in the Democratic primary, no matter what party you're a member of. Vote in the Democratic primary. Vote for Bernie. Virginia, request a Democratic ballot. New Hampshire, if you're non-declared, if you're a Republican, you can't vote. That would be illegal. Don't do anything wrong, ever. Don't. We're not Democrats. We're not going to harvest any ballots. We're not going to do anything tricky. But if the law lets you exercise your franchise, go vote for Bernie. Now, you know, I think Pete Buttigieg is the toughest opponent out there. I've said so for many months. But I, per- and I think the weakest opponent out there is Elizabeth Warren, who, co- who cannot win any of the three states they must win, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, or Michigan. I think Bernie is actually a pretty strong candidate. But I want socialism on the ballot so that Americans can choose and we don't get the spin machine saying, oh, if only Bernie had gotten the nomination. I'm with you, Bernie bros. You got cheated four years ago. Not this time, and Republicans are going to help you not get cheated if we can just persuade Emo and Toby to write the true story. Don't go anywhere, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Poor Joe Biden. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Party is over. Joe Biden, who has been on two ballots with President Obama, run for president twice, been elected since I was in high school, approaching 80, expecting, well, expecting people would, come on, man, come on, give him a break. That he has advantages. Let me tell you, I think I'm more in step with the lingo than any of them. He knows that, he knows the key facts. Iran is 40 million people. Actually, it doesn't, it's got 80 million people. But Joe, he's been out there, he, he tried to be relevant. Play the radio, make sure the television, the, excuse me, make sure you have the record player on at night. The, the, the phone. And he's at 11%. 11%. I le- I, I, I'm looking at two new polls. New Hampshire Democratic presidential primary poll, Boston Globe, Suffolk, Biden 11%. New Hampshire Democratic presidential poll, WHDH, Emerson, Biden at 11%. And I, I run down, you know, Sanders up by four, Sanders up by 10, Sanders up by nine, Sanders up by 10. There is one poll that shows Buttigieg has surged to within one. But Joe, 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 it's done. You're throwing your vote away if you vote for Joe Biden. Done, done, done. And uh, I, I can explain to you a lot. A lot of it is people have realized the Obama years were terrible for America's national security. The Iran deal was terrible. The Paris deal was terrible. The trade policy was terrible. The regulatory uh, burden was terrible. The military cuts of sequester was terrible. And Joe Biden, as Bob Gates said, the Secretary of Defense under President Obama and President Bush, Joe Biden hadn't been right about a national security issue in 40 years. So can Pete Buttigieg come from behind and beat Bernie? Bernie says his ideas are not radical. Cut number 19. Bernie last night on CNN says, no, I'm not a radical. Cut 19. I ran last time and I came to New Hampshire. And I talked about raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour and health care as a human right and climate change. A lot of the establishment, the political establishment and the media establishment. Hey, Bernie's a nice guy, but he's he's crazy. <laughs> nice guy, but, you know, his ideas are so far removed from reality. Ain't nobody going to support that. And we came to New Hampshire after tying in Iowa. We came to New Hampshire and we won here, won the state by a good margin. And the importance of that is not just for me. I don't mean, you know, help me politically, it did. But more importantly, what the people of New Hampshire said, these are not radical ideas. These are ideas that make sense to working families throughout the country. So that's issue number one, where I think there is a change. Ideas that four years ago seemed radical are now part of the mainstream. And many of my opponents uh, are kind of, in, in one way or another, echoing what I said four years ago. Issue number two, I'll tell you what is very different. Four years ago, I talked about climate change. People say, yeah, well, he's right. It's a serious problem. Right now, what I see all over this country, when I talk about climate change, people say, yeah, we got a real crisis here. We've got to do something, you know, really got to respond. And I'm so proud of the young people in this country. We're proud of the fact that we have the endorsement of the Sunrise Movement of young people in this country and people all over the world, young people who are saying, you know what? Hey, adults. Hey, big leaders of the world, we want to live in a planet that is healthy and habitable, and we want that for our children as well. That's how Bernie is winning the under 50 vote. Pete Buttigieg is winning the over 50 vote. Go figure. By the way, Bernie is, um, he talking wildfires in Australia are in your future. Cut number 14. In terms of climate change, Anderson, the debate is really over. Uh, Nobody can say with a straight face, well, it's about jobs when we are talking about the future of the planet. When we are talking about whether or not cities in America and around the world will be underwater, whether we're going to see more and more drought. Everybody knows what's going on in Australia right now. If we don't get our act together, that is the future of the world. We are seeing a prelude to that in California with their terrible forest fires. I was in Paradise, California. 
He, you know, I don't, it, it makes no sense, right? But that's Bernie. Bernie, by the way, tells you health care is number one, cut number 13. Bernie Sanders on with CNN's uh, Anderson Cooper last night. Well, actually, most members of Congress, I believe, are. I think the majority are on board for Medicare for all in the House, not the Senate. Um, this is how you do it. And, and this is the answer I'm going to give tonight, time and time again. That what our campaign is about, and I admit it, it is a different type of campaign. Because I'm not here to tell you, vote for me and I'm going to do all these great things. Ain't going to happen that way. It never happens that way. Real change never takes place from the top on down, no matter who the president may be. We need to involve millions of people in the political process. And when millions of people stand up and they say to Mitch McConnell or any Democrat, we're sick and tired of paying, as is the case right now, for the average family, $12,000 a year. We're sick and tired of the deductibles. We're sick and tired of the co-payments. We're sick and tired of paying the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. We are going to take on, as a nation, the greed and the corruption of the pharmaceutical industry. That's when it happens. And that's what our campaign is about. That's why we call our campaign us, not me. Because I'm not here to tell you I can do it alone. I can't do it alone. We need to all stand up to take on the power of the healthcare industry. Now, Pete Buttigieg was also on CNN, and he's not going to be outdone by Bernie. If he has to run far to the left, he's going to run far to the left. Cut 21, Pete talking about his health care plan. What I'm proposing with what we call Medicare for all who want it would represent the biggest transformation in American health care coverage since the invention of Medicare itself. We're talking about the most progressive, boldest thing done to health care in a half century. But crucially, it's also something I believe we can now gather an American majority around. The, the difference between my plan and some others, uh, the idea of, of uh, the reason it's Medicare for all who want it, is that I don't think that we should order people onto that public plan I believe we ought to create. I think that it will be the best plan. If we're right, then everybody will want it and everybody will choose it and eventually it will become the single payer. They can't run the Iowa caucus. They can't. They can't count votes, and they want to run your health care. Emo and Toby think that's radical. They're writing that up at Media Matters. But I just say the Democratic Party is in charge of their own caucus in Iowa, and they can't. We don't know who won. I think Pete Buttigieg won. But they won't tell you they got to have a recount, Tom Perez. You want to have a recount on your lab tests when you're uh, in the ER and you're... Uh, flatlining? You want to have a recount? I don't think so. Uh, Pete Buttigieg went on to talk about gerrymandering. Like I said, he's gone way to the left. Pete was going to win as a centrist, and he was getting some momentum. Maybe it's maybe he's got momentum now because he's gone way to the left. Pete Buttigieg on gerrymandering. Cut number 20. We also need to make sure that our system overall is secure. It's why we need paper trails on election technology. And we also need to face the fact that not only are our elections threatened by interference from abroad, but frankly, there's a lot of homegrown election interference. I would argue that gerrymandering is election interference, because when politicians can pick out their voters before the first vote is cast, it, it changes how an election will happen. So, so I want you to listen to that again. Not only are our elections threatened from abroad. All right, so let's go back. Pete Buttigieg. Um, that wasn't single play payer again, Ben. I don't know what that was, but I want you to play it again. We also need to make sure that our system overall is secure. It's why we need paper trails on election technology. And we also need to face the fact that not only are our elections threatened by interference from abroad, but frankly, there's a lot of homegrown election interference. I would argue that gerrymandering is election interference because when politicians can pick out their voters before the first vote is cast, it changes how an election will happen. Uh, one more time. Play that again, Ben. We also need to make sure that our system overall is secure. It's why we need paper trails on election technology. And we also need to face the fact that not only are our elections threatened by interference from abroad, but frankly, there's a lot of homegrown election interference. I would argue that gerrymandering is election interference because when politicians can pick out their voters before the first vote is cast, it, it changes how an election will happen. There's also a lot of homegrown election interference. I think that's what he said. I think he said, we need paper trails 
on election technology, which doesn't make any sense. And not only are our elections threatened by interference from abroad, there's a lot of homegrown election interference. Can we play that one more time? Make sure I, I just want Emo and Toby to hear this. We also need to make sure that our system overall is secure. It's why we need paper trails on election technology. And we also need to face the fact that not only are our elections threatened by interference from abroad, but frankly, there's a lot of homegrown election interference. I would argue that gerrymandering is election interference because when politicians can pick out their voters before the first vote is cast, it, it changes how an election will happen. You know, there, there isn't any gerrymandering in a statewide primary. Uh, it doesn't make a lick of sense. He's running in a statewide primary in New Hampshire. Now, gerrymandering has been around from the beginning of the republic in state and congressional districts. But that's not election interference. That's a feature, not a bug. And you'd have to change the Constitution. Sometimes I I just get confused by Pete. I really do just get confused by Pete. He also added, most Americans want a pathway to citizenship for illegals. Cut number 22. This has to be a country that manages things like immigration in a way that aligns with our values and our laws. Part of it is that we need to update our laws, which haven't been changed since the 1980s and have made it impossible for us to manage immigration in a common sense way. But part of it also is recognizing that immigration is part of the lifeblood of this country. And when I think about the city that that I served as mayor for two terms, we're not full. We, We lost tens of thousands of people after the factories closed. We need more people. And there are so many communities that I go to, especially in rural areas, that don't just have a job growth challenge. They have a population growth challenge. It's why part of what I've proposed is what we call community renewal visas. It's part of my vision for how we uh, increase uh, the economic prospects of rural areas, is that if uh, an area that's hurting for population wants to welcome more, and many do, even in more conservative areas, Oh, you know, I, I, he might be right. I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of people clamoring to fill up the cities, but maybe he's right. I do hear people clamoring for relieffactor.com. There you have it. The uh, North Carolina blue bag, line green. I hope you're watching on Town Hall TV. I hope you're watching on The Universe. I hope you're watching on YouTube. I hope you're watching wherever, because I want you to hear and see relieffactor.com. It works four pills every morning. I take it in the first hour. I remind you in hour two and three. I sip my honorboundcoffee.com and I take my relieffactor.com and I'm ready for the day. I get you moving in the morning. I get you going. I know you're out there, Lucy, listening. I had dinner last night with Lucy and Rick, the fetching Mrs. Hewitt, Catherine and John. I didn't ask how many of them take relieffactor.com, but they're all active and going. We'll take your calls. 1-800-520-1234. The phones are lit up. We'll take your calls. But Pete Buttigieg, I think you know, it, it, it's Pete and Bernie. Uh, look, Mike Bloomberg's not going to get the nomination. Chris Christie's right. It's going to be Peter B- uh, or Bernie. Joe Biden's faded. Peter Bernie. Which one do you want? It's the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Pete Buttigieg just amazes me. We also need to make sure that our system overall is secure, he says. It's why we need paper trails on election technology. Really? Paper ballots? I'm all for that. It's also why we need to face the fact that not only are elections threatened by an interference from abroad, but frankly, there's a lot of homegrown interference. Wow. Pete is admitting cheating. He's admitting cheating. I am all for admitting cheating. Emo and Toby, get that down. That's that's vitally important. Let's go to the phone. John in Delaware. Who, what say you, John? I just wanted to say hello, Emo and Tony. Good job. Toby. Guys. It's Great Emo job. and Toby. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Hobie. Anyway. Toby. I all to... right. Never mind. If you can't get it right, we're I'm not going to talk to you. Um, uh, 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 Vance. Why does Bernie Sanders Vance. Fear Vance. Why? Why? Vance. Go ahead. Vince, you're on, Vince. Go ahead. We lost them both. Charlie in Cleveland. How are you, Charlie? Morning, Hugh. How are you doing? Good. Good. Listen, I just wanted to point out something that I don't think you mentioned when you were playing that clip from Bernie, uh, invoking the wildfires of Australia being the new world standard if we don't do something about this uh, religion. Oh, my gosh. I just don't understand. Pete in Bakersfield, California. Go ahead, Pete. 1 800 520 1234. Morning, Hugh. How you doing? Good. Uh, <laughs> I can't help but think every time I hear Bernie Sanders talk about an older cartoon that I had growing up of the ant and the art bark, all I picture is the art bark in my head when I hear that guy talk. What? I, I don't know the ant and the art bark. It was, I, I'm in my late 40s, so it was like on the same uh, uh, cartoon schedule as the Pink Panther. Look up Ant and the Aardvark, and that Aardvark, I swear to you, was Bernie Sanders in a previous life. Could have been. Uh, do you? By the way, <laughs> uh, you're in California. You get to vote in the, uh, no, in the March 3rd open primary. Who are you going to vote for? Uh, I've got Kevin McCarthy. No, no, but you. Oh, you. You've got to. He, he's got. He's going to get the nomination. Take the Democratic ballot for president. Ah, uh, it goes against all of my well-being. We need Bernie on that ballot. You got it. I mean, I. I we know who's going to win, but you're right. We, we need, need Bernie. We need a straight-up choice. All right, thank you, my friend, Jim in Georgia. What say you, Jim? I say you're absolutely correct, and that's amazing because I don't normally like the idea of voting in somebody else's primary, but we can do that here in Georgia, and I, I've, for some time I've thought, we need this debate. We should have had that in 16. We could have had this out and probably settled by now, but Democrats are going to drag this out. All right, well, we're just going to need to uh, And by it. the way, about your qualms, I would like every state to close their primaries. I would like only yeah. Republicans to vote in Republican primaries and only Democrats. But as long as the law allows them to screw with us, we are allowed to play in their primary when ours is decided. It doesn't yes, work they, one way. It works they, both yes, ways. Indeed. They can change the law if they want, but you South Carolinians, go vote for Bernie. Amen, brother. Thank you, my friend. To Kelly in Washington State. Hi, Kelly. Hey, uh I had a question. Wasn't the uh, fires over in Australia sent by, uh, started by a bunch of radical people? No. Of, no, it was climate. Definitely climate. Don't worry about it. It was climate. Uh, Jeremy Louisville. How are you, Jeremy? Hey, how you doing, Hugh? Good. Um, I was wondering to know if you um, are worried about the uh, Bernie Sanders capture and the youth vote and having a... Uh, a ton of turnout versus Trump. Well, look, I, I think he's a tough opponent. If I was trying to tank the election, I'd vote for Elizabeth Warren. She's the worst candidate. She's the easiest to beat. But I want to beat socialism. I believe if this country is going to vote for Bernie, there's no saving it. But if we put it on the ballot and defeat him decisively, we can at least shut up a lot of the people in the media who pretend to be free market people but live in cloistered retreats with tenure. And, and cloistered with retreats with tenure is what kills us. J.D. in Vegas. Go ahead, J.D., 30 seconds, friend. Hey, uh, the Democrats got a heck of a choice. Uh, a 79-year-old guy that just had a heart attack four months ago and a 38-year-old guy from South Bend, only known for Notre Dame. 
I know. It, it's Bernie and, and, and Buttigieg. Uh, Bloomberg's out there, but I, I just don't think it'll matter. Thank you, friend. You know what does matter? Don't forget, honorboundcoffee.com. If you're having coffee this morning, you're listening to me, I wish you were drinking honorboundcoffee.com. 100% of the profits from Pete and Seth New Talbot's new coffee service. You get your first bag, you get the second bag free, four different um, blends, four different grinds, and one great cup of coffee, and 100% of the profits support military families. Also want to remind you, as I did at the beginning of the hour, go see the Clarence Thomas movie this weekend. All right, do not wait until next weekend. Skip the Oscars. Go see JusticeThomasMovie.com. Clarence Thomas, in his own words, if you've never seen him, you never heard him at length, you'll be blown away by what a great American he is. I'll talk to Larry Arn about that coming up after the break. Larry Arn joins me, America. Don't go anywhere. Hillsdale president next. The Hillsdale Dialogue next on The Hugh Hewitt Show.
Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, candidates. Hugh Hewitt. That music means it's the last radio hour of the week. It is the Hillsdale Dialogue this week with Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College. As I remind my new listeners down in Pensacola, you can go to hillsdale.edu, H-I-L-L-S-D-A-L-E dot E-D-U, and you'll get everything about Hillsdale, all their online courses. You can sign up for the free speech digest uh, in Primus. And if you go to hughforhillsdale.com, you'll find every conversation I've had either with Dr. Arn, the president of Hillsdale, or one of his many colleagues on the faculty or staff dating back to 2013, beginning with Homer up to the present. And indeed, this week, we're very much focused on the present because we had a historic event. We had a, a vote on impeachment, Dr. Arn. Uh, good morning. Great to have you. Good morning. How are you? It's only happened twice in the, uh, in the last century, three times in the history of the country, that we've had a vote on impeachment. So it is a rather significant day or week, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, so, uh, Andrew, uh, they, get, they get farther and farther from success. So a- Andrew Johnson was almost convicted in the Senate. Uh, two votes, I think. He fell, sh- fell short of conviction. Uh, Bill Clinton's wasn't close, and Donald Trump's wasn't close. This was a wholly partisan exercise in the House. They had a half a vote. Uh, from a Republican, Mitt Romney voted for one article, voted against the other article. So it was a wholly partisan, I, only in America would someone call that bipartisan. It's just a wholly partisan exercise. Is that what impeachment was ever intended to be, Larry Arn? Well, uh, the first and significant thing about it is it's supposed to be hard to do, right? And it, yes. it is hard to do. It's never successfully done against the president. Many judges have been impeached um, and, and convicted. So it's a it's a political exercise, obviously, because it's politicians in the House who bring charges and prosecute, and it's senators in the Senate who become jurors, and they're elected officials, and that's crucial because if you appointed a high tribunal of you know grand poobahs and satraps, then they would have effectively have the power over the president over the executive action of the United States. So politicians do it. And then in the Federalists, they predict that it will be wholly uh, uh, political exercise. And, you know, it, it's not just that it takes both the House and the Senate to produce the result. It takes two-thirds in the Senate, extraordinary majority. And so they would have had to get, what, 20, roughly, defectors in the Senate to, to, uh, to get him impeached. And there, there was never any hope of that. What they wanted was what? They wanted the talk of this. They wanted to change the conversation. Uh, and then hope that something would mess around in there and you'd find something. And they hoped as well to injure Martha McSally of Arizona, Cory Gardner of Colorado, Susan Collins of Maine, David Perdue of Georgia, Tom Tillis of North Carolina. I believe, according to Leader McConnell, all five are in better shape polling-wise now than they were at the beginning of this. Though, of course, we cannot expect Adam Schiff to speak the truth about what a fiasco this has been. No, he. Uh, it, it's uh, some of this is just seems shameless to me. There's no... Uh, you know, when, when Ronald Reagan was president, and Ronald Reagan was about as assertive as this guy about change and about as ready to be an enemy of the existing order, there was still kind of buddy ship uh, and, and civility and, and whiskey drinking together between him and Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House. And this is just hostile now. It's just, you know, Nancy Pelosi tore up Trump's speech in, on the camera just as he finished it. And you know that's a, that that just that just means these people are not very fond of each other. <laughs> well, it's also a speech in which General McGee, at Tuskegee Airman, was honored. It was a speech which remembered the life of a soldier who was killed by Soleimani as his wife and son watched. It was a speech in which a four-time deployed soldier was reunited with his wife, daughter, and son. It was a speech in which many American heroes of many sorts were honored and Nancy Pelosi tore it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh I that that seems to me an important miscalculation. 
And the whole thing is kind of dropping the veil, right? Now, now you see uh, this won't do. And I, I think they've, you know, they've, they're in full rebellion, and they'll do whatever they can. And, you know, this campaign season is going to be fierce. Now, I, I wish to play for you something, uh, a quote by Andrew Weissman talking with Nicole Wallace of MSNBC. And Andrew Weissman was the Javert of the prosecutor. Uh, We know Robert Mueller now not really in control of the Mueller investigation, the special counsel investigation. Here he is complaining that the president would not testify. In essence, complaining that he would not walk into the perjury trap. Cut number seven. Facts. Um, so I think um, you know, there was something very interesting when the Italians were trying to get rid of Berlusconi, and they had a, a very, very similar demagogue who also was amoral. And one of the ways they did it was you don't just talk about his you know, personal failings. You go to the facts, and you talk about why his policies are wrong. And I think that's what the Democrats have to point out, that all of this is just adjectives. There's actually a complete dearth of the president saying, what exactly is wrong with these people? What have they, what have they actually said that's incorrect? And the second point is, it is noticeable that the president mouths off today about this. But where was he at, in the House? Where was he in the Senate? Mm-hmm. He never submitted to an interview. He never testified under oath. It's true. The same happened in the Mueller case. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there's a classic reason. There is legal jeopardy that attaches if you sit for an interview or if you um, say something under oath to federal prosecutors, to the House, to the Senate. So if you notice, the president is happy to talk today about, oh, this is evil and these people are corrupt. But when it came time for him to sort of put up or shut up, which is, are you willing to actually say this under oath or even in an interview, he's completely silent. So to me, one classic way of dealing with this is to say, you know, a lot of your people testified and they were willing to come in and say something under oath Mm -hmm. under the penalty of perjury where were you now larry arn that is a prosecutor he was the leading prosecutor because robert Mueller was a figurehead calling the president who he prosecuted a demagogue and amoral what does that tell you about this the Mueller investigation which was followed hard on by the impeachment yeah well but Mueller hired a bunch of partisans. You know, you, you can bet, by the way, that it, if they had something, and they were, see, first of all, if they had something, they wouldn't need Trump's testimony. But what did they have? You know, what, he, the, the great, it started with the charge of collusion, and uh, his verdict about that was he couldn't rule it out. <laughs> you know? There was no collusion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, you know, he doesn't. He doesn't. He says he, he names no co- collusion, <laughs> and then says, "I can't. I can't say that it didn't happen for sure." Well, it, tr- Trump's testimony won't add anything to that, except the possibility that he gets he gets a date wrong or the stuff that they do to them now, and uh, then they then there's a whole new. Uh, cause of action, whole new worm, a can of worms opened up. And so he wanted Trump to do that, but, you know, defend, ordinary defendants are cautious about doing that. And this is the president of the United States. This was an admission by the chief prosecutor that he believes the president is a demagogue and amoral. He yeah. is supposed to be a prosecutor representing blind justice. I think it's a, a stunning admission. Yeah. Yeah, and after, after uh, I think of the stuff that happened in the FBI, that, you know, those, the, and just name one thing, right? There's two guys, Peter Strzok's one of them, and they were, they were investigating all this stuff, and they were leaking about all this stuff, and meanwhile they were sending emails to each other about how they're going to prevent Donald Trump from becoming president. And that's just so far from being the function of the FBI. It is a breach of their duty. It is so far from, and this is what I want to emphasize at the conclusion of the impeachment, the people on trial here are not the president and his team. It's, it is the people who pursued him. They have done a horrible disservice to this country and left a scar on the Constitution. And I will talk more about that with Dr. Larry Arn 
constitutional scholar, author of, of many books on this and, and many more to come, I hope. Hillsdale College, all things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. Stay tuned. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. The Hillsdale Dialogue is underway. Hillsdale.edu for all things Hillsdale, the Lantern of the North. Hillsdale College educates thousands of students every year. It is one of our last best hopes for actually literate college students going down and spreading sweet reason across the land, but especially in Washington, D.C. Dr. Larry Arn is president of Hillsdale College. We are talking about both the impeachment vote, the failure to remove the president, the acquittal of Donald Trump, and his State of the Union address, which came out before the vote, and then his remarks on Thursday about his acquittal, which followed his Thursday morning prayer breakfast. He is a president fully engaged in the fight, Larry Arm. We haven't seen this in a long time. <laughs> well, it, his State of the Union message is, uh, was a very remarkable thing. Uh, first of all, he had a lot, of, lot to report. There's a long list. And uh, I didn't realize that they were going to get 500 wall, miles of wall built. I thought that they were going to get 100 miles. They have that much. But so anyway, every, everywhere he turned, there was a big thing, and you know, and he's all over it. He said, he said I would, and so I did. This is the kind of speech. But then what? The other thing about it was was that it was an incredibly aggressive speech, and marked something. We've heard State of the Union messages by what in in, in memory we've had Ronald Reagan and, and two people named Bush, and this one was more deeply controversial, even when he was saying things that all three of them said. Why? It's just the political divide is widened now, and now you have to make a choice. And so the fact that he stood up there and said, you know tax cuts and school choice and no late, no partial birth abortion. The fact that he said all that, it just was like uh, you, you, I, I, you could feel in the room, it was an act of courage, deep hostility. And uh, that's, you know, we don't talk like that anymore. If you say things like that on elite campus, college campuses, there'll be demonstrators to drive you out immediately. And so he stood there and said that, and then more uh, stronger still, he called them out. How many, 130 people in this room have voted for this thing, you see? And they were there dressed in their, in their garb with the different ones. The women were white, and there were some other ones. And they were there ready to stand up and shout, and he wanted them to. And that just means he's not... Uh, He's not cowed, not at all. Well, I do believe we continue, I continue, I'll say I continue to underestimate TV skills of a man who did television for 10 years. And he's very aware of his timing, he's very aware of the reactions he's going to elicit, and he's very aware of how it's going to play at home. And so the audience was down a little bit in total numbers, but the people who turned in saw, among other things, Rush Limbaugh receive the Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor available, uh, after a diagnosis of stage four uh, lung cancer, a terrible thing. And it cheers his base. It outrages the left, and it draws the line clearly. I, uh, so I, I, I'll say a word about Rush Limbaugh. It turns out that, that I spent an hour and a half with him the day after he got that diagnosis. Oh, my gosh. And uh, I, I go see him once in a while. I've, I've, I haven't known him as long as I've known you, you Hugh, but almost. And, uh, and you know, he's, he's an interesting man. He's very smart. He's an excellent listener. He's an excellent talker. We just all talk, talk a blue streak every time I see him. And this was no different whatsoever. And uh, he looked good. He reported himself strong. Uh, it, we laughed a lot. I, I just want to say, you know, he's such an important man. He's a pioneer, which you and many others follow. And, and uh, that, that Trump did this for him, that was just, just right. That's I believe that, I, I've said it many times, Rush Limbaugh built the talk radio mall. I'm just a tenant in it, as is everybody else. I get to be Nordstrom like Sean and 
and Mark Levin and, and Dennis Prager and everybody else who's followed were all just tenants living in the mall that Rush Limbaugh built. But more importantly, he changed the conversation in America to allow the conversation to occur. When we come back, we will talk about that, the impeachment, the State of the Union, and the campaign ahead, because Iowa sort of voted, sort of, and New Hampshire is a Bernie Buttigieg race, and Joe Biden is setting below the horizon more coming up on The Hugh Hewitt Show.
Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. That music means it's the last radio hour of the week when I discuss with Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College, all things Hillsdale, or found at hillsdale.edu, including an agenda of where Dr. Arn will be speaking. You can go out and see him and the opportunity to sign up for Imprimus, the speech digest of Hillsdale College. I've been negotiating with a guy. He's coming to the Nixon Library sometime in April, and I will get to roast him in person, I think, when he does that. But, Dr. Arn, I don't want the normally when we do this, we're talking about Homer or Thucydides or Plutarch. I want to spend a a little bit of time in this segment on two current events, the Iowa caucus and the coronavirus, because they are not unrelated. First of all, as we speak, there are 61 people on a cruise ship off of Japan with the coronavirus. There are uh, thousands in China with the virus. There are hundreds dead 31,000 people admitted by the People's Republic of China to have the virus. It's shown up all around the world, and I have read The Great Influenza by John Barry. I know how influenza's pandemics work. Are you worried? Well, uh, our friend Senator Cotton is all over this, and he's the one that made me worried. Yes. He he said, apparently he's been telling them, and they're doing it, in the Trump administration, whatever is the most radical, effective thing you can think of, do that and then think of something else. Because it, you know, it could get really bad, and it seems to spread very fast. And what is it? There's, is it now 70 million people in quarantine in, in China? Yep. And that's hard to do. A, uh, a, uh, I know a great doctor at the Cleveland Clinic, and, and he works for the King of Saudi Arabia, sometimes, and uh, he was in a consultation one time. Uh, the king of Saudi, Saudi Arabia is going to go to Bali, and they had built, built a brand-new airport to take his plane. Everybody's excited, and then the bird flu came. And so there's a meeting of big, fancy doctors. Can, they, can we protect him? And the meeting went on for a long time, and toward the end, uh, most people thought they could. And, uh, and then this doctor said, he's the head of preventive medicine, he said, you don't have to protect him. 800 people are going on this trip. You have to protect all of them. And, and then if you fail with one of them, this will be all over Saudi Arabia, whether the king gets it or not. And everybody went, oh, yeah. See, that's how bad it is, right? You can't, you can't send a large body or even a small body of people into the area without thinking it's going to come back with them. Now, when, when the great influenza began in Kansas in 1918, traveled abroad in our troop ship, spread throughout the continent, it's known as the Spanish flu because that's the only place where there was not censorship and people wrote about it. It went dormant for a while and then reappeared in a more virulent form as viruses are apt to do near Boston, destroying as it went with rising mortality, even as morbidity increased, and it became quite the destructive event. And I think Senator Cotton is aware of the great influenza by John Barry and other similar stories. Panic is different from worry. Panic is bad. Worry is good. And if, if this happens, how does it cut politically? I am curious your, your assessment of that, Larry Arn. Well, goodness knows. Uh, I guess... If it hits the blue states, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, you know, if there will be, so the way it becomes a political football is that there will be claim that there's something Trump could have done that he didn't do. And, and mind you, by the way, those, those claims are right. That's why we have oppositions, right? We don't. Neither you nor I want Donald Trump to have unfettered power. I actually think Donald Trump doesn't want unfettered power. But, but we, of course, if there's something that we can do to stop this, then we have to do it. I mean, to keep it from becoming severe in this country and to save as many people as we can. And so that was Senator Cotton's point. Do everything, right? And he's, you know, Trump is doing a lot. He's curtailing travel to whole countries now. And, uh, and you know, that's a... That's a big deal, but that's how this stuff moves around. And 
and it kills. Now, now let me read to you something that just came across the wire. Breaking news is our forte, even though we're talking usually about Homer. Employers added, I'm reading from the Wall Street Journal, employers added 225,000 jobs in January. The jobless rate was 3.6%, signs that the U.S. labor market is positioned to fuel economic growth in 2020. Wages increased 3.1% from a year earlier, a touch higher than December's annual rise of 3%. Economists surveyed by the Wall Street Journal had forecast a job growth of 158,000 and an unemployment rate of 3.5% and year-over-year wage growth of 3%. January's robust payroll gain points to a continued healthy labor market in the U.S., an economic expansion now in its 11th year. Over the past three months, the U.S. economy added an average of 211,000 jobs. Job growth was revised higher in the last four months of 2019. Here's the key fact, Larry. Economists were expecting 158,000 jobs. They got 225,000 jobs. But unemployment went up because, as the president said in the State of the Union, millions of people are flocking back into the job market over the last three years who had given up under Obama. It's extraordinary. Mm. Well, I think it's, uh, that, that, that fact is one of the most promising uh, facts of economic statistics I've heard in decades. Why? We, we've, we, we have developed... You know, here's the, here's the way it goes. We talk of an underclass in America. And they won't work, and they don't have to, and they, you know, there's a terrible article about Appalachia, about how people get their EBT payments, it's food stamp payments, and they, they go and buy cases of Coca-Cola, and they take it to the next place over and sell it for 50 cents on the dollar to turn it into cash. <laughs> So you buy drugs with that, right? And that's, you know, you read those stories and you're just devastated. And those stories are from the place where the war on poverty was started 50 years ago, right? And it's, it's, if it's anything worse. So then you just read the desperate thing. Those people have been ruined. Come to find out, not. Come, come to find out, those people are human. They want to work and be responsible for themselves. And the unemployment rates among among the the most the worst among the racial minorities that have suffered the most, the unemployment rates are at historic lows. Yeah, and the average hourly earnings increased by seven cents last month to twenty eight dollars and forty four cents an hour. Wages were up three point one percent from a year. Pay has grown at an annual pace of three percent or higher for eighteen consecutive months. And this is the key. The share of Americans working or looking for work ticked up to 63.4% from 63.2% in December. The so-called labor force participation rate has remained steady in recent years, defying economists' expectations for the retirement of baby boomers to drag down the rate. People want to work. They expect to live a long time, and they're working longer. Yeah. If... um uh, and you know Trump's uh, the economic reforms are farther reaching than ever because Trump has done more to curb the regulatory state than anyone has done, and uh, he just you know there's some thousands of regulations now. Uh, it, they made that rule that became appealing that uh, every time you uh, put in a new regulation, you had to repeal two. They're running at 8 to 12, repealed for every new one. And apparently the staff at the Office of Management and Budget are cooperative. And they like the idea that they should not live in fairyland, but they should have to m- m- measure the cost of what they do. And, that, you know, that's a, if he could get that spirit running through the federal government, and that'll take, of course, a long time, but it is running in places. And, and, and this brings me to Iowa, which I wanted to talk to you about. Um, they want to take over the medical system, 100%. Democrats do. They can't run a caucus. Yeah. Well, um, it's very possible that the app rebelled against the quality of the candidates. <laughs> 
hadn't heard it put that way yet. <laughs> that artificial intelligence took over and they said, reject, reject, reject. The, mm-hmm. the real interesting thing, and I, I'd like your comment on this, is that Joe Biden, eight years at the side of Barack Obama, comes in fourth. And in the last two polls in New Hampshire, he's at 11 percent in either third, fourth or fifth place. 11 percent. He was the vice president for eight years with Barack Obama. What does that tell you about Joe Biden? Mm -hmm. Well, I already knew. (laughs) (laughs) No, he's a so let's say a word for Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden is a public servant of many years experience. And he's a, he, he, he seems wonderfully, to my mind, to my eye, old-fashioned compared to most of the rest of them. He's from a different time. Uh, you know, he has some manners. And, uh, you know, and who am I praising manners? I, I put up with Donald Trump. But it, it, and his manners, Donald Trump's manners, are mostly very good. It's just once in a while, maybe not. So, I, you know, he, he looks like, still looks like the adult in the room. But, you know, this Ukraine stuff, what I first believed when all that broke was that that was, that, that was getting its energy because it was a hit on Joe, Joe Biden because his son is all wrapped up in that stuff. And he is probably all wrapped. And I think maybe that's part of what's happening here. Well, there is. Uh, uh, this is the blue bubble effect on media, which is so deeply destructive of understanding politics. If they won't talk to each other on air about the reality of what America sees, they are unaware and they they thicken the blue bubble. And I, and I do believe that blue bubble is so freaking thick, they cannot understand that the American people saw 50 or 80 or whatever amount of money that Hunter Biden was making and came to a conclusion 30 seconds later that that something was rotten in Denmark. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, his, his dad had been there with him, and, and uh, his dad had intervened forcefully in Ukrainian politics and bragged about it as a sign of his strength as an executive. And I'm not actually, I don't know whether... Crimes have been committed, and and still less. I don't know whether whether uh, American, you know, violations of U.S. law have been committed. That's what investigations are about. Uh, but it looks shady, and you know, and it, uh, we we talked about impeachment. There's a point to say. What one condition of impeachment is, you have to be able to point at something that he did that was not part of his duty. It's a date-stamped issue. We'll be right back. A final segment on impeachment, a historic week in the United States. Dr. Larry Arn, historian and president of Hillsdale College, is my guest. Don't go anywhere except to hillsdale.edu. And, of course, to relieffactor.com. Dr. Arn has uh, got a doctor who's a believer in my four supplements. Those four supplements, of course, I carry in curcumin, resveratrol, and omega. You should be taking them. Every single day, you ought to be taking them before you go to work. If you are leaving the house for a long Friday commute, turn around, go back, and take them so that you can enjoy the weekend. Whether it's full of exercise or frivolity, whether you're lying on the couch after Super Bowl exhausted you or impeachment exhausted you or State of the Union exhausted you or the National Prayer Breakfast exhausted whatever it is, relieffactor.com will help revive you, get you out there moving around on the weekend as you should, regardless of the temperature, regardless of where you live. Relieffactor.com is 1995 for a three-week starter pack. Go and get it. Come back for the final segment with Dr. Larry Arn.
I ran last time and I came to New Hampshire and I talked about raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour and health care as a human right and climate change. A lot of the establishment, the political establishment and the media establishment, hey, Bernie's a nice guy, but he's, he's crazy. <laughs> nice guy, but, you know, his ideas are so far removed from reality. Ain't nobody going to support that. And we came to New Hampshire after tying in Iowa. We came to New Hampshire and we won here, won the state by a good margin. And the importance of that is not just for me. I don't mean, you know, help me politically, it did. But more importantly, what the people of New Hampshire said, these are not radical ideas. These are ideas that make sense to working families throughout the country. So that's issue number one, where I think there is a change. Ideas that four years ago seemed radical are now part of the mainstream. And many of my opponents uh, are kind of, in one way or another, echoing what I said four years ago. Issue number two, I'll tell you what is very different. Four years ago, I talked about climate change. People said, yeah, well, he's right. It's a serious problem. Right now, what I see all over this country, when I talk about climate change, people say, yeah, we got a real crisis here. We've got to do something, you know, really got to respond. And I'm so proud of the young people in this country. We're proud of the fact that we have the endorsement of the Sunrise Movement of young people in this country and people all over the world, young people who are saying, you know what? Hey, adults. Hey, big leaders of the world. We want to live in a planet that is healthy and habitable, and we want that for our children as well. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. The Hillsdale Dialogue is underway. All things Hillsdale are available at hillsdale.edu. Dr. Larry Arn is my guest. He is the president of Hillsdale. He talks to young people all over the country. Bernie Sanders says they're going his way. Bernie Sanders represents... I, I voted for Bernie by absentee in Virginia because I want a choice, not an echo on the ballot in November. Uh, are those ideas less radical, Dr. Arn? You know British history. You know when the socialists broke upon the scene and, and shattered the party system in Great Britain. What do you make of Bernie thinking that the young people in America, whom you see every day at the campus of Hillsdale College, have gone hard left? Well, the Socialist Party entered uh, entered British politics the same year Winston Churchill did. They, said they got their first seats, just a few in the House of Commons, in the year 1900, and they got their first majority to operate with in 1945. So they burst on the scene over the course of 45 years. And you have to remember that uh, Churchill would say this sometime, sometimes, the election of a social, socialist government is the kind of trauma that would only follow something cataclysmic like a defeat in war. And that's when it happened, you know, the worst war in history, compromised the power of Great Britain, and then they elected a socialist government, and then they threw them out six years later. So, yeah, I, it, 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 these ideas have been around for a long time, right? They're, they're offshoots of a German historicism, historicism, which dates from the early 19th century. So, sure, you know, for a long time. And are they, the, the question is, are they good ideas? And if they're not good ideas, then their adoption will lead to disaster. And the point about the young, uh, the young are, you know, uh, they, they need to be learning, and they are surely growing up, whether they're growing up well or not, and they change very fast because every big thing they do is new to them for years. So I wouldn't, if I were Bernie, I wouldn't depend that the youth have adopted this argument because... You know, I mean, it's against the law, virtually, to even have a sense of humor about global warming. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, a lot of people do. And uh, so it's, um, uh, this, this, remember what his claim is. It's amazing. It's one of the sharpest divides in American history. It's, it's, It's not quite like the Civil War, but it's getting there. Donald Trump is going to restore, right, make a great again, right? And what they're going to do is these new problems change everything, and we have to sweep everything out of the way to deal with them. And in one form or another, all of the candidates on the Democratic ticket, including Joe Biden, are saying that. And so it's just a very stark contrast, and... Uh, but do you uh, believe you work with college students every day? If people are taking their children up to see Hillsdale College and make a campus visit, you're more than likely to run into Dr. Arn, so you have to add an hour to your schedule. And so uh, when you talk to these 
these youngsters, and they are young, they're 18 and younger, are they what Bernie says? Well, my ones are crazy, of course, but, uh, it, you know, because you come to Hillsdale College, first of all, it's like joining the Marine Corps. And, uh, you know, everybody knows it's hard. Everybody knows we got to study all this stuff. Everybody knows we're going to be treated like we're ignorant and uh, also listened to and compelled to think and talk about things that we're not ready to do, right? It's, it's, it's very old-fashioned in that way, so it's slightly artificial. But it's also true that uh, they, you know, they are aware of all these trends and all these trends in all of the big controversial subjects, you know, climate change, sex, all that. And they have opinions about them and they argue about them, and some of them are on Bernie's side about climate change. But they argue and they think, right? And also, they don't think that they know everything. Boy, what an advantage. What an advantage to not to be aware of what you do not know. Dr. Larry Arn is here every week to remind me of what I don't know, and hopefully you as well. All of the Hillsdale Dialogues are available at hugh4hillsdale.com. Go to hillsdale.edu and get your application. Send your child there if you want them to be educated in an age of complete illogic. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Generalissimo. Thank you, Dr. Arn. I'll be back Monday on New Hampshire Primary Eve on the next Hugh Hewitt Show.